I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture on homeowners associations. Um, this is a very important topic. You know, there are estimates that 60 million Americans are now living in homeowners associations, that most of new construction is taking place in homes that will be part of homeowners associations. And it's an international phenomenon. Uh, last week's Economist had a report about Buenos Aires, saying that they had more than 400 gated communities in the city. Uh, one of them has 17,000 inhabitants, its own schools, hospitals, and hotels. So clearly these sorts of developments have all sorts of implications for property rights, land use regulation, taxation, uh, both within the association and between the association and larger government jurisdictions. Um, for example, in 1831, a real estate developer named Samuel Ruggles put aside two acres of open space as an amenity for house plots he was selling around the perimeter. And he was going to give each purchaser of a house lot a key uh, for this park. And um, you won't be surprised that one of the first results was a property tax case uh, arguing that because a plot of land with a key had more value than a plot of land without the key, that the city shouldn't tax the park because it was already taxing the value in the homeowner's assessment. And that's Gramercy Park, which today is still in existence under those uh, conditions of the only private park in New York City. So we're very fortunate to have with us today to help explain all of this and reflect on the implications. Uh, Gerald Korngold, a professor at New York Law School, a longtime dean of Case Western Law School, and a visiting fellow here at the Lincoln Institute. Uh, Jerry's an expert on real estate transactions, property law, land use <coughs> regulation. Uh, he's the author of numerous articles, uh, law review uh, pieces, uh, several books, treatises, case books. Um, he's an elected member of the American Law Institute, which drafts model legislation and reviews the law. Very influential group of judges, scholars, and practitioners. And he's a member of the American College of Real Estate Lawyers. And most important of all, as you will see, he's a very gifted educator. Uh, so please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Joan. Uh, thanks to the Lincoln Institute for the opportunity to be here with you today uh, to talk about community associations and condominiums and their role in our society and with uh, individuals. Residential developers increasingly impose schemes of covenants, restrictions, and easements, generally known as servitudes, on tract housing, townhouses, and high-rise building units in order to increase the marketability and value of these properties. These servitudes might be created by common law interest or pursuant to statutes, such as condominium statutes. But the effect of the restrictions are pretty much the same, whether they are common law creations or created by statute. These servitudes are recorded against each parcel to which they apply, so that a subsequent buyer of the parcel can have notice of the restriction against it, the various limitations and obligations that will be required of her as a new homeowner. Covenants and restrictions as a means to create residential communities have been in existence for quite a long time in the U.S. and in England as well. Joan mentioned Gramercy Park, Lewisburg Square here in Boston is an early example. For quite some time, developers have been using restrictions and easements to create what would be viewed as pleasant housing communities that both restrict what owners can do 
in terms of creating disturbances for their neighbors, but also give amenities such as the park in Gramercy Park to the neighbors. Today when we think about restrictions on ownership, our immediate reaction is this is due to zoning or some other kind of public land use control. However, you have to remember zoning is a creature of the 20th century. The first zoning ordinance coming in New York in 1916 and zoning really spread out throughout the country in the post-World War II building boom. Prior to that time, the only way that people could restrict their communities in terms of creating safe havens for residential uses against the onslaught of industrialization was through private agreements, through covenants, restrictions, and easements. So these have a fairly long history dating back to the example that Joan cited to Lewisburg Square here earlier in the 19th century, but getting into full swing in the latter part of the 19th century with grand subdivision communities being created, St. Louis, uh, well-known uh, communities, uh, Shaker Heights, Ohio, uh, well-known community, and many others that were created. Now, servitude developments are commonly referred to a variety of names, but we'll use the term common interest community, or CIC, different ways to refer to them. Now, the servitudes in a CIC can be whatever the developer chooses, but typically the servitudes are reciprocal, meaning they bind every landowner, and every landowner has a right against each other under the servitudes. They're mutually and reciprocally enforceable. All owners are bound by and benefit from them. The developer can choose whichever covenants she wants, but markets force developers in certain directions. And servitudes usually, as a result, come in various categories. So generally, this is what you might see. So you would see restrictions on what homeowners can do with their properties. Uh, you see rights created in homeowners in common facilities, such as a pool or a park. Obligations to pay fees on the homeowners to support the common facilities. And the creation of a private government to uh, be elected and comprised of the homeowners in order to administer and enforce the servitudes and to promulgate rules governing the association. Again, the specifics will vary, but on this next slide, I have some typical sample servitudes that you might see building restrictions, uh, there might be restrictions on the type of buildings, the layout of buildings, design, materials that can be used in exteriors of buildings, paint types, visible home de uh, decorations, restrictions on ancillary structures, on swing sets, landscaping, the type of landscaping, um, the use of the property, typically residential only, barring commercial use, barring pets, a common one which we'll talk about, restrictions on behavior, noise, <laughs> occupants of the property, restrictions on signage, no political signs, no religious symbols, we'll talk about that, leafleting, uh, restrictions with respect to vehicles, uh, the types of vehicles, commonly restricting RVs from being parked uh, in this subdivision, and various traffic rules about speeding, uh, where you can park, etc. There are also then uh, amenities provisions, granting rights of the owners in recreational amenities, in infrastructure, 
in roads, utilities, and the like, and creating services, security, landscaping, uh, and others. My talk uh, today uh, is going to focus on the rather complicated public policies and legal doctrines invoked by the validation and enforcement of CIC regimes. And I'm going to explore with you three issues, three central issues. Looking at CICs as a secession from the larger community, the conflict between the CIC and the individual owner, and the obligations of the larger community in turn to the CIC. There has been tremendous growth in the number of common interest communities uh, over the past 50 years. This slide, for those of you in the back row, uh, demonstrates this, and let me just show you a couple of numbers. 1970, there were 10,000 of these communities with 2 million residents. 2012, 300, 23,000 of these communities with 63 million residents in these communities. All size communities, and it would count what would traditionally be condominiums, cooperatives, mostly a, fun, a, a, a form used in New York, though there are some in Boston, some in DC, some in Chicago, and also uh, what you would call a horizontal homeowners association community of single family homes or townhouses. All size, this would account for. 63 million people uh, out of our 300 million plus population. I have seen uh, this number mentioned and I have a source for it from a fairly serious organization. I have not been able to get deeper data from them, but reporting that 80% of all homes currently being built, this was 2003, are being built in association communities. So tuck that nugget away uh, when we talk about alternatives uh, available to unhappy individual owners. <laughs> First issue, secession from the general community. So one of the major critiques of common interest communities is that they encourage and cause a secession by the well-to-do from the general community. It is argued as a result that rather than helping to solve urban uh, ills uh, and problems of cities, that CICs exacerbate these problems. Uh, the point was articulated quite strongly by former Secretary of Labor and noted academic Robert Reich uh, in a piece, Secession, uh, and I have a typo, which would be Secession of the Successful uh, there. In many cities and towns, the wealthy have in effect withdrawn their dollars from the support of public spaces and institutions shared by all and dedicated the savings to their own private services. Condos and the omnipresent residential communities done their members to undertake work that financially strapped local governments can no longer afford to do well. Uh, more ironically, perhaps, uh, illustrated by this New Yorker cartoon. Uh, I'm sorry, but this beach is for residents only. Uh, as the pilgrims arrive uh, and are greeted by uh, the true owners uh, of the property. Here's how the secession argument rolls out in a little more detail. The CICs take over from the, uh, the, from the municipalities a competing sector of services available to those who can afford them, who uh, pay for uh, certain services, and those who live in municipalities who cannot afford these amenities simply have to do without. So parks owned by the community association and the CIC are limited to those residents only. And so it creates a pattern of housing for the haves and have-nots. 
This argument continues that the CICs cream the affluent citizens capturing their tax dollars for private amenities instead of making that available for their fair share of general tax revenues. It exacerbates, so it is claimed, the separation of the cities from the suburbs where indeed most CICs have traditionally been built with the citizens of the CICs no longer feeling part of the city, uh, living in a privatized development supported by private funds. And you can drop a footnote to the changing uh, reurbanization, though, and there are now increased number of CICs uh, happening in that reurbanization. Opponents of the CICs also fear interest group politics, that uh, community uh, associations are already organized through their private governments and can better lobby legislatures to enact various provisions that favor the private governments over the general municipalities. That has been uh, asserted, though, again, I have not seen data bearing that out. And finally, a claim of homogeneity. There, there's a risk of homogeneity in wealth, class, and race uh, that uh, emerges from CIC communities. Okay. There is, though, a powerful counter argument, starting with this notion of freedom of contract. We have long allowed people to spend their money the way they want to, to enter into contracts that they wish. And that is part of a fundamental American <coughs> belief that people can pursue whatever joy they wish. Part of our US constitutional guarantee of contract and it is only in rare situations where there is a vital public policy where we intrude on that right to contract. And the law generally recognizes this notion. This is from a case here. I think that one's big enough for you all to see, a court declaring its adherence to this right to generally do with land what one wants. Inequality is a serious issue raised by critics of CICs and by Secretary Reich. But in some ways, that argument says too much. The truth of the matter is we live in an unequal society. We have unequal access to food, to health care, to schools, to pick as the one distinguishing point community associations and to make that the area where we draw the line not clear that that case has been made strong enough uh, to justify why community associations, uh, common interest communities somehow should be placed beyond the pale. It is also to somewhat of a mistaken assumption to assume that all common interest communities are for the wealthy. And you sort of stack the deck when you make that argument. Is that really the case that they are all rich enclaves? So I've been trying to tease out data on this and it is somewhat difficult to do, but here's a little piece, perhaps, of the story that I have. This is a, uh, a little bit of data on the median sales price of existing homes over several years. You can note, of course, the big drop from 2008. The first line is comparing the median price for all residences, single family homes and including co-ops and condos. All co-ops and condos are by definition common interest communities. So this is not the silver bullet, 
but it does tell us that the median price between at least these kind of CIC homes and general homes is almost no difference. So again, just a little slice, early slice of data, uh, but something worth pursuing. There certainly are very high-end, wealthy enclaves of CICs, but there are others which appear not to go as high. So that's something worth pulling out. There's another issue too. By using common interest communities, developers are able to provide more affordable housing and more green housing. Rather than spreading out over 100 acres, 100 single family homes on one acre lots, by using cluster housing controlled in a CIC development, they can locate that on 25 acres, leaving 75 acres as green space, and lower the cost for each of the individual units. So there are trade-offs. So I need more data. We need more data to talk about this issue, but careful of the trap that it's rich versus the middle class or the rest of us when you look at these issues. The last issue, homogeneity. I haven't seen any compelling data to show me that CICs present a larger problem than general suburban housing. I think this is a function of suburban housing. It's a function of exclusionary zoning, which is a widespread problem. If that's the issue that needs to be addressed, then it should be addressed. Uh, we have fair housing laws which apply equally to CIC housing and non-CIC suburban housing, but I don't see the automatic leap between the two, and I've been looking, believe me, a lot for such data, not seeing it emerging. I will also say, too, that courts have been particularly engaged in the CIC area to watch for overreaching where a CIC attempts to create homogeneous environments. There was a spate of litigation about maybe 20 years ago involving the attempts to locate group homes typically for the disabled, within CIC communities. And the CIC restrictions typically limited occupancy to single family units. And many, many, if not most of the courts, responded by striking down restrictions that limited uh, these uh, group homes. And I have for you up here just to give you a flavor of the kind of opinion that courts came out with. I'll read it for you. Recognizing that institutional care can seldom provide the kind of individualized support which can make the difference between productive self-actualization and unproductive stagnation, the legislature has adopted the development of small community care facilities as a preferable alternative to hospitals, rest homes, and the like. These residences provide an alternative family structure offering the aid, encouragement, and companionship necessary to help disabled persons realize their full potential. Given that purpose, we believe such facilities coincide with the traditional objectives and values associated with single family residential neighborhoods. So courts have not been asleep at the switch when it comes to the homogeneity uh, issue. Proponents of CICs also argue efficiency in terms of the efficiency of the CIC, that private managers uh, under contract with certain contract specs uh, deliver higher quality, cheaper services than government, and there are no free riders. Everybody pays in order to get the services. 
There is also this question when CICs are uh, accused of seceding, there is a question of who seceded from whom. One of the reasons for the significant growth of common interest communities was the passage of Proposition 13 in California, which limited tax revenues. And at that point in time, municipalities essentially said to developers, if you're going to build something, we don't want any new burden at all coming out of this community. You need to organize it as some kind of homeowner association, condominium, or the like, you need to internalize all of the costs that would come out of this development and set up your own private little residential community. So this has been actually cited by quite a number of scholars as the big spur to the boom of uh, common interest communities, so um, they are somewhat chagrined when they're accused of secession. You can think as well of um, common interest communities as very much part of the American tradition, perhaps of utopian communities. Um, lots of these communities uh, throughout our history, they're not for me, they might not be for you, but they're for somebody, and we have tolerated uh, those indeed. This is one that I saw a new one, which I will say is not for me, but I guess it's for someone. This is the Citadel. It's in Idaho. It's a community that's built to be ready for environmental Armageddon or Armageddon following some kind of nuclear or conventional war. And this is from their FAQ on their website as they're trying to make their pitch for what they're doing. The model will be similar in many ways to that of Disneyland. <laughs> Poor Walt is rolling over in his grave. It is walled, gated private property with controlled access. People pay to enter and agree to the rules because they see value in doing so. It is all based on a voluntary agreement between the owners of the property and those who want to come inside. Millions of people come to Disneyland and interact peacefully, surprisingly similar to what we are doing. <laughs> to each their own, yes? Okay, De Tocqueville, going on almost 200 years ago saw us as a country of associations. Americans of all ages, all conditions, and all dispositions constantly form associations. And he describes this as something uniquely American. The issue has been placed into sort of a false binary paradigm. Secession or not. Gated communities, good or bad as if we have to make an actual choice between the two. I think we're able to understand common interest communities in a more sophisticated way. And so a term that I've come up with is this notion of augmented federalism. Look, we live under a federalist form of government. We have loyalties and obligations to a variety of governments, to our local government, perhaps a county government, to a state government, to a national government. The fact that we serve one, pay taxes to one, does not excuse us from serving the other. I think we can see people's participation on a voluntary basis in a common interest community as joining yet another government. The fact that they're there does not excuse them from their obligations to the municipality. Uh, and they can remain part of that and should remain part of that uh, as well. I think as a second matter, there are serious income and urban issues that our country does indeed face, but those ought to be addressed as the separate issues that they really are, rather than somehow through the guise of an attack on CICs. Okay, next issue. CICs versus the individual owner. It's 
often perceived, especially by an aggrieved owner, that uh, common interest communities oppress individuals, might oppress individuals. Uh, and for an ironic take on this, look at this cartoon. This I'll have to read for you. The sign says, welcome to Condoville and the illusion of owning your own property. <laughs> so this says it all for those individuals who have problems. And in particular, what disputes seem to boil down to in these common interest communities between individuals and the community, they're about substance, where an owner's goals and aspirations for her property can be frustrated by the application and enforcement by the community of the covenants in a particular situation and may veer into intrusion with personal autonomy. Substantive problems are especially acute where the association adds a new rule or changes a rule after a person has bought into the community. The second area where there's often conflict is process, where the individual owner feels tyranny of the majority that the association is picking on him, that he's being singled out for some kind of high-handed treatment. Now, Evan McKenzie, in his noted book, Privatopia, really buys into this critique, uh, the community associations, featuring a pri form of private government that takes American preference for private home ownership and too often turns it into an ideology of hostile privatism. Preservation of property values is the highest social goal to which other aspects of community life are subordinated. Rigid, intrusive, and often petty rule enforcement makes a caricature of benign management, and the belief in rational planning is distorted into an emphasis on conformity for its own sake. Okay, he doesn't like this. There are certainly reports uh, that you see in media outlets and in court cases that involve covenant enforcement that frustrates owner aspirations in a, in a serious way or looks just foolish or wrong. Now, we need to be wary of the media reports. There's, of course, the sensationalist. They're not a fair sample of the vast number of CIC owner interactions. <coughs> Media reports surprisingly sometimes get it wrong. And there's often a decent resolution of the issue that never gets reported because it's not as interesting sensationalist and won't lead the Live at Five uh, broadcasts in such a neat way. But with that said, Let's look at a little sensationalism. Let me walk you through these. There are so many of these. As you can see, I really had trouble whittling them down, so the backbenchers I'm going to have to read for. First one, Associated Press item. Marines' parents sued over sign of support in their Bossier City, Louisiana front yard. They had a three by six foot sign, a picture of their son in uniform who was being deployed to Afghanistan for 14 months and they had a text, our son defends our freedom and the homeowners association sued. There was a ban on signs. Next one. Homeowners Association removed and confiscated mezuzot uh, posted by Jewish owners on their doorposts because this violated a rule prohibiting objects on doors and in hallways. There's similar cases with Christmas wreaths hanging on doors. That was a case that went up to the U.S. Court of Appeals, Seventh Circuit in Chicago. Next one, from CBS Philly TV station. Bucks County woman fined by homeowners association for colored Christmas lights. Now, I'm 
was not fully aware of this, but there's a big distinction among homeowners associations between white Christmas lights and colored Christmas lights. Often there are rules that permit the white Christmas lights as long as they're not blinking, but colored lights are not approved. So she uh, had uh, her colored Christmas lights up. There was actually a vote by the members. 19 were for the white lights, 14 were for colored lights, five for blinking colored lights, and the association ruled white, you know, please. Next one. Association barred the posting of a campaign sign in the window of a home by of a guy who was running for public office. He couldn't put, Joe couldn't put vote for Joe in the window of his own home. That went up to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Last one. Stone Oak resident claims that the HOA, Homeowners Association, harassment over a porch gate that they installed to protect their autistic son, to keep the child from running off the porch out into the street. Um, they were fined $600 for this. This is from a TV station in San Antonio. Last one, grandfather is doing time for ignoring a judge's order in a dispute over resodding his yard. St. Petersburg Times, he claimed he could not afford to resod his yard. His mortgage had reset up, his car had been repossessed, the association sued, he was ordered to pay $795. When he failed to pay, the court sentenced him to jail for contempt. Whoa. Okay. So you have all of these stories, um, sensationalist, <coughs> shocking horror stories, but let's try to back up for a minute and try to see why there are good reasons why we enforce covenants against individuals seeking to break the agreement, although not in every situation and try to distill out. First reason is efficiency. We generally believe that agreements freely entered into in the marketplace will yield the most efficient use of our limited resources. This is something that benefits not only the parties to the transaction, but benefits all of us because more goods and services will be produced and available for us to buy. So our legal system will enforce such consensual arrangements between parties unless there is a very, very special reason to intrude. Without certainty of enforcement, people will not enter into these efficiency maximizing deals. If I can't count on the other guy to perform, why would I enter into an agreement? If one party can walk away without liability, the other party will lose the benefit that she bargained for. Consider this, how this specifically applies to common interest communities. Common facilities. The 100 owners and this Happy Acres development have decided that each one of them do not need a swimming pool. To my mind, makes a lot of sense, right? They don't want the cost of installing a swimming pool, of maintaining a swimming pool, cleaning a swimming pool, paying the insurance, paying a lifeguard, et cetera, et cetera. They've decided that one pool is enough swimming access for them. One pool, they will share the cost for the building of it and for the maintenance and lifeguards, et cetera, over time. An efficient allocation of resources. Why should the law intervene to stop that? No reason at all. Moreover, the law should not allow 10 of these 
100 who have agreed to suddenly pick up and say, eh, don't want to swim anymore. Because that will shift costs, unexpected, over to the remaining 90. Okay, those are common facilities. Restrictions. The 100 people in Happy Acres have made the decision that no exteriors can be painted electric lime green, okay? They have made the judgment that that turns off most people in the market and that electric lime green is going to reduce the value of their properties by giving up some of their individual controls, swearing off of electric lime green, each can increase the value of their property, and the law should respect and enforce this value-maximizing decision. And the law has generally recognized this, at least in more recent years, and has enforced it. As a related matter, there's another reason why common interest community covenant should be enforced, and that goes to choice and reliance. We've already talked about to each his own. People get to choose and do what they want to bind to the community they want. It might be a golf community, it might be a horse community, it might be whatever. People like to do what they want to do. If people choose to buy, we need to respect their choices and keep dissenters from destroying the choices that others have made. Don't erode the choice of people by allowing some to destroy those expectations. Now I have a slide here which tells us about the general attitudes of residents towards their common interest communities. The vast, vast majority of people enjoy what goes on in their communities. They see these as value maximizing, both in dollars and both in terms of psychic benefits. 70% rate their community association experience as positive, 22% as neutral. People have chosen in, respect those choices. Now, most courts understand this reliance. Again, over recent years, and you can see this court here. The original restrictions are closed with a very strong presumption of validity, which arises from the fact that each individual unit owner purchases his unit knowing and accepting the restrictions to be imposed. A use restriction in a declaration of condominium may have a certain degree of unreasonableness to it and yet withstand attack in the courts. If it were otherwise, a unit owner could not rely on the restrictions found in the declaration since such restrictions would be in a potential condition of continuous flux. This court note is saying it can even be unreasonable, whatever that might mean. If people know about it, it's in the original documents and they buy subject to it, they are bound. Now, the tricky situation is where there is a rule that is added or changed by the private community. They add some kind of rule. Many courts hold then that that rule must be reasonable. Reasonable is the all-time wiggle word of the law. What does that mean? for hours, for a lifetime. We could talk about that. But it subjects it to some kind of scrutiny that it must be reasonable, though typically they put the burden on the owner to show that the rule was unreasonable and give the association a lot of latitude. But that's not even uniform. Other courts say a homeowner should not be heard to complain when 
as anticipated by the recorded declaration, the homeowners association amends the declaration. If you know when you buy that the rules can be changed by the association or by the governing board, then you're stuck with that. This is really a pretty hard line response. Others would still graft in a reasonableness component. Okay, so far it's been on the defense of why CICs are a good thing. There are other reasons as well. Increased flexibility. We need private governments and community associations because one thing we're sure of, things change. The cost of snow plowing goes up. The cost of energy goes up. Things don't seem to go down. But there's changes in terms of services that people need. As a community ages, they might want more of this service and less of that service. Racquetball is out. Yoga is in. We need to have flexibility in how these covenants are administered. So having a private government helps that. Additionally, these standards are not self-actualizing. We need a group to enforce them. When we have aesthetic covenants, which are usually not much more description to them than harmony with the neighborhood, we need a group to look at them and make such a decision. There's a certain administrative efficiency as well where you can have a smaller group make decisions rather than requiring unanimity. Unanimity, as our economist friends would tell us, means the chance of a holdout. And the holdout, that one out of 100, can obstruct changes necessary or extract uh, monopoly profits for the exchange of his vote. We generally tend to expect rational action by a homeowner's group. Um, we tend to expect that because the governing body also owns property. They're not going to do things that are irrational that will destroy their own value, hopefully. All right, so where, how do we pull this together? What should our rule be, our rules, our guidelines dealing with the individual versus the community? Okay, here's a suggested approach. Substance of restrictions raise concerns when they brush up against the personal autonomy and fundamental individual rights. Consider, for example, these limitations. A limitation on having pets passed by a rule ex post after somebody has bought in. A limitation on political signs. And here's this one. This is a real one. It's a covenant restricting occupancy of units to traditional single families. And they define it mom, dad, that kind of traditional single families. What I would suggest as a way to deal with substance is that restrictions are valid if they limit spillovers, or you can call it fallout, or as economists would say, externalities, on the rest of the subdivision. So if these limit spillovers on the rest of the subdivision, the rest of the community, that's fine. But they are invalid to the extent that they attempt to limit the nature and status of occupants or behavior within a home. You could limit noise. You can limit cigarette smoking in units to the extent that there's seepage between the units. But you don't limit marital status or not of couples within the unit. So you're making the distinction between fallout on the rest of the community, but drawing a zone of privacy within. And we're starting to see some of the courts seeing this distinction. Fairly recent cases, a subdivision restriction barring immoral purposes. 
some homeowners complained that there were some couples cohabiting. Therefore, immoral purpose, they had to get out, right? Sell their homes, leave. Court said no, immoral purposes, we're talking about prostitution or other sex crimes, okay? This one, next case, uh, North Carolina, 2007, rejected a definition of a single family as a group related by blood or marriage or a group of persons otherwise structured in the same way as the traditional view of an American family. But you see the last one still adhering to an old group. So this ain't America anymore. There's some youngsters here, you know, those youngsters meaning 35 and under, I have no idea what this is. This is Leave it to Beaver, right? The model American family. I was going to put up my three sons there to show you that somehow we've always tolerated five men living together in suburbia and the world did not end, but I think the point is clear. So we're talking about some kind of fundamental space within homes. Pets, I'm sorry to say pet lovers, um, that's probably can be upheld as a reasonable rule. The noise, the sharing elevators, um, the mess, euphemistically in the common areas, etc., as a reasonable decision of the common interest uh, communities. There is, however, some interesting new developments coming up, though, with service dogs. Uh, how do we deal with those? And the use of service dogs has been expanded, as you see, uh, beyond the typical or traditional service dogs for sight impaired persons, uh, much more use of those. So here's what I have for you dog lovers here. We'd like a building where a sweet little Cairn Terrier can bark once in a while without the neighbors getting absolutely hysterical. So dogs actually, a lot of cases uh, about those uh, there. Another difficult area is free speech. Because free speech, unlike family choices within the home, free speech does create spillovers outside. Aesthetic, right? Signs all over the lawns create aesthetic problems. Uh, noise, an intrusion on quiet. And some people just really want quiet. And so speech does create spillover problems uh, there too. If this were the US government attempting to ban all signs, the US Constitution would apply. But the trick here is this is by private contract, not by government. And the First Amendment talks about governmental limitations on speech. Even though there are spillovers, I would maintain that speech is so fundamental to our Republican form of government. And I would argue to the private government as well too, that we would probably, uh, or we should probably uh, preserve access to speech in some ways within even these private communities. The source of the law might be through various doctrines which prohibit covenants that violate public policy and hold that a total speech ban should be impermissible. Some manner, time, manner, and place restrictions ought to be uh, valid but not a total ban. This is a very tough one. It took the US Congress to pass a statute preempting private covenants that banned flying the US flag. That happened about a dozen years ago. But other speech is not. Religious freedom, also another tough one there. Christmas lights, crashes, statues of saints, the Mezuzot, the Sukkot, all kinds of cases, news reports, problems with the homeowners association. Religion is also part, a fundamental part of the American experience. But here's the real tricky part here with religion. I don't want a court weighing how important 
a particular symbol is in terms of religion. I don't want a court saying, oh, a wreath is just decoration, but a crash is really something with a stronger religious content to it, or a mezuzah is really important, fundamental to the religion, but actually, did that owner have the scroll inside of the mezuzah, which is really the religious content? Ugh. No, we don't want our courts doing this. So that's a tough one uh, to deal with. One would hope some kind of accommodation, but that's one which I wrestle with. Um, there are also needs for procedure, um, fair procedures, notice, opportunity to be heard, equal treatment. That just comes out of the law of contracts. One would expect that uh, in no bad faith decisions. And many CICs have become more advanced to advance their procedures. They don't want to end up like this. This is I clipped out of the post where all the good stories are. Yoko was having a fight with her village co-op. Co-ops, for various legal reasons, have a greater amount of power over individuals. Um, and she's duking it out, claiming that they're unfairly treating her um, as a matter of law is one question, but there's also, you don't want to be on, uh, in the New York Post. Okay, last subject, just, uh, and this was again sort of just summarizing the, um, the issues I had this slide up before. Larger community versus the CIC. Here's the basic problem. Owners in common interest communities pay property taxes. They pay at the same rates and assessments as owners of homes outside of CICs. Let's think of a single family home in a CIC, pays at the same rates, the same taxes, if you will, as a single family home down the street that's not in a CIC. But the government does not provide services for the CIC that it provides for the other owners. The CIC, rather, has to pick up its own trash, plow its own streets, um, handle security, perhaps, as well. And the CIC pays for their trash by charging their owners a fee to do it. So what do owners say? This is a double tax, right? Paying our property taxes plus our CIC dues, this is a double tax. Now, there is a little differing analysis if the double tax was in effect before someone buys, or if there is a change after someone buys, right? If there is, for example, no services and I buy in, well, what should I do? I should adjust my price down because I know I'm gonna have to pay extra money every year to the community association to pick up my trash, and so the house is gonna be worth less to me. If I am in the house and the city passes a new reg and says, oh, no more pickups at uh, common interest communities, then I'm really aggrieved. But even in the first case, where the community says to the, the developer, we're only going to give you a building permit or give you your subdivision approval, if you agree to set up a common interest community and pick up your own trash, that developer then is going to pass that loss onto the unit owners. That developer is going to take that hit. Now I can understand the developer taking a hit for having to put in infrastructure. If the developer brings in a lot of new traffic to the area, it's perfectly appropriate for the community to say internalize that cost you ought to put in an extra lane of the road next to your subdivision because you're bringing in more costs. But property taxes supposedly are to pay for services that are rendered on an ongoing basis. 
So why is it that people are paying for these ongoing property service, uh, property taxes, but not receiving services? So I think there is both in a, inefficiency and unfairness in either way you do it. Either the owners are taking a hit when they've already bought and there's a change, or the developer is taking a hit when he's being forced to accept a regime of no services but full uh, tax. There's a tax equity issue as well. To the extent that a CIC owner is paying full taxes and no services, she's subsidizing other people in the community. We always have subsidies, but don't we like to think about them a little more clearly? There's also great opportunities for rent seeking, right? 10% of the owners in town are in CICs, 90% aren't. Guess who's going to be footing the bill <clears throat> for the 90%? You wonder about any notions of shared sacrifice in such an environment. True, very true, that municipalities are facing a tax crunch. But is the correct approach to sort of pick on those that they can and stick them with the bill, even though these are single family homeowners otherwise looking very much the same? So how do we do this? I think you need a legislative solution. No taxation without sanitation, right? This is where it ought to come. But talk to me about power politics if it will come. I could think of judicial, of legal challenges, but it makes me feel dirty to do so. I don't think courts ought to be involved in second guessing local government decisions on constitutional theory. Like it's a bad road to go down. I could come up with some equal protection arguments. I think they're not great, but they're plausible. But that really is not a way to go. This is a plea to, to legislators to think about efficiency, to think about fairness, to think about tax equity, and to build communities through shared sacrifice and not to put the burden on the owners of CICs to subsidize the rest of the community. So in our time together, I hope I've raised some interesting issues for you about the public policy and individual rights within CICs. I thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. I leave you with this final slide to make your own judgment. <laughs> and this one here is you see heaven a gated community. Uh, there it is. So thanks a lot. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions, comments that you might have. Yes, sir. Do CICs have any obligation to maintain the value of the units for the unit owners? So is the issue that the CIC is spending money that benefits only certain owners but not other owners? To some degree. That can be an issue in terms of decision making and decision making based on bias and unequal treatment and something worth looking at. It's probably going to be really hard to tease out. Um, I would expect that a court would give significant deference to a, an elected representative group. Uh, they typically defer to associations, whether it's a community association, whether it's uh, the Boy Scouts or a, a church or um, religious group. But yeah, that would be, I think, sort of the way you could go. It, I don't know that they have an affirmative duty to do anything to build your property. I think the reaction would be is, you don't like the job they're doing? Go to the ballot box. Run for office. Can I complicate the question? Sure, sure. sure. Okay. All right. Say the expenditure of funds, that is common funds, for the purpose <laughs> of trimming trees that have a benefit to some owners but no benefit to others. 
Is that is that legit with regards to the board of managers, or should they somehow or other approach whatever it is in a totally equal manner? And are they trees that need to be trimmed? Arguably, one could take the view that they don't. One could take the view from the standpoint of ocean views that yes, they should be, but you could take the view that no, they don't need. To. Um. My guess, without knowing more, it's the legitimate exercise of discretion by the board. And it also sounds like you won't be able to put your political sign when you're running for association board in your window, but hang out in the rec center and talk to people. I, I don't think that that would be sort of anything seizing the corporate opportunity. They don't really want to wander in the weeds too much uh, second guessing those decisions. The, the statistics you gave us on CICs had both what I would think of as uh, you know multifamily buildings, you know what once was an apartment building. If you're going to give people unit ownership, you almost have to have a CIC um, by definition. On the other hand, some of the gated communities we're thinking of are single family <coughs> houses, where in fact you could or could. You, there's more choice. So I'm just wondering if we know, if, and I'm not sure where ta townhouses probably fit on the apartment side of that. I'm just wondering if we if we know anything about the breakdown of, of of those units. And the related question is, from a legal perspective, does the law change in your mind if we're thinking about a CIC that is one, literally one building versus a CIC that is governing a community which is in fact many separate buildings? So the law has some more complicated wrinkles if you're dealing with a single building, a fire in a single building, and do you rebuild? How do you make that decision to rebuild? Uh, that's a, a complicated issue as opposed to an individual fire in, an, in a freestanding private home. So condemnation also is difficult um, uh, dealing with those issues. If you have partial condemnation, if you have two tall buildings, one is taken, the other isn't. So there are some complications. Uh, the only, I don't know that the legal standards change. The rule still might be you know, on changes of rules, you have to be reasonable. The context will be different. The facts will be different. You know, the little Karen Terrier, that's from the New Yorker, they're talking about barking from a high ride, you know, a multifamily uh, building from one to the other. It will be different when people are not in each other's hair as much uh, being close by. But essentially, um, the difference lies I think less in sort of the size. Um, Co-ops are somewhat of an outlier because of the nature of how they're organized as a single corporation and the co-op board is given more power, particularly on the purchase. Co-op boards have power to disprove, mm -hmm. disapprove a purchaser, um, which does not happen in a condominium or a homeowners association. Um, but otherwise, no, not so much. Not so Do you have a sense of, of does the, do we have any data on the, the mix of? I, I do not. One thing that's interesting though, you refer to the single family homes as gated communities. They are not all gated. There are a lot of these subdivisions. It's hard for you as you roll down, roll through areas, uh, to even know that you're crossing from one to another. But so many are being built now with even a retention pond, retention pool that they, they have to put in to catch uh, water. That's a common facility. That might be it. You know, no tennis court, no pool. Um, and it could be 20 houses, and those just happen uh, very, very commonly the community doesn't want it. Yes? About homeowners associations, any sense of um, who's driving that? I mean, that's an exponential increase in, since 1970 of these um, associations and, and the 
question is this really. Are they are they driven by the private developer, do you know, or more so by a lot of communities, particularly suburbs that when you reach certain thresholds, they require certain things. If you're gonna build a subdivision of fifty houses, you've got to have two acres set aside for passive recreation. If you go over a hundred you have to have a common area with a playground. More than that, maybe pool, tennis courts, that kind of, that, that, that the city requires you to do. Do you have a sense if there's, um, you know, if it's driven more by city go you know, regulations or the developer wanting exclusivity, quality, control over design, or do you have any ideas? Or anything? Yeah, I think there are a lot of factors. I think the big boom that started in the late 60s, the 70s came for two uh, big factors. One was Proposition 13 and the pushback from municipalities that did not want to take on responsibility for infrastructure, for new parks. They wanted those privatized in essence and owned there. That was one. The other thing was condominium statutes, again, something which we all are accustomed to and, and very comfortable with, the condominium structure was only sort of approved and passed in the early 60s across the country. Before that, you could not build vertically. You could, and you could try to set it up by common law vehicles, tenants in common with respect to the uh, air shafts and all that, but banks wouldn't lend on that. They were not comfortable. So once the condominium structure got approved, it was, again, whoa, FHA would now approve loans and to condominiums, so that was also uh, a big boom. And then they were this ability to do cluster homes as well, uh, too, so it came out. But I do think, as you point out, too, now local communities asking for dedicated land, it, there are now other forces that are, that are driving it. Daphne? I'm wondering about services provided in the CICs and wondering, do any of them provide schools, ambulance service, health, welfare? And I'm trying to think of the CICs that aren't uh, multifamily, like condos, whether they're kind of uh, local government light, you might be able to figure out what fraction of a typical local government's budget would it uh, represent services provided by CIC, or are they like country club plus? Um, <coughs> I think some of the senior condos have some what you'd sort of call social services, um, activities um, taking place all day, uh, I think sort of verging now more towards social services that some communities would provide or that if you were living in um, some kind of uh, other facilities that those would be pro provided. That's an interesting question for me to look. The ones that would be sort of richest to look at for that, there's some mega ones in the South, you know, Florida, Texas, California, those are where the big ones tend to be built. In Cleveland area, right, that b building has come as it's moved out towards Solon, Bainbridge, those areas, but even backfilling back towards, um, you know, those uh, empty spaces, backfilling back in Shaker University Heights, they're going in as uh, condos in various small association communities, and they're attractive even down the hill, down into um, into Little Italy, that, that, that it's not so new, but I guess 10 years old, but that very high-end one. Armando? Sure, I have still trouble about uh, taxation without sanitation. <laughs> what is the rationale for not providing that service to people who are paying taxes like everybody else? Because they can. That's not right. <laughs> Boston, you know, all the condo associations. Okay. I mean, I can see if you send your child to private school, you should be still required to pay your taxes and pay for other kids to go to school, you've opted out. But if a service is actually bid, I, I mean, should your child be excluded from the public school because you're the new guy? Doesn't seem right. 
Yeah, I'm, I want to talk about that and think about the numbers. I mean, the big local expenditures are for schools, mm -hmm. schools, and schools, right? <laughs> and then you have police protection, and then you have fire protection. And my guess is that there are very few community associations that produce, provide any of those services. And when I say police protection, I'm talking about people who carry guns and can arrest us, as opposed to people who, you know, yeah. drive around and carry guns. Yeah. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> arrest people who look, who don't conform to the profile that you use, right? Um, but, and in terms of sanitation and water, everywhere I've lived, I get direct bills for sanitation and water supply. I've never paid for those services through my taxes. So that leaves, you know, street lights and snow removal and things like that. And then the question is, are the roads private, at which they are, I presume, in some communities, or, or are they public? And if, they, if they're public, normally when you transfer the roads to the public community, the public community is responsible for maintaining the roads. So, I mean, how big an issue is this? It, it's got to be pretty modest in, in most places. Clearly, there has been the phenomenon of local governments not wanting to increase general property taxes, so they split out the fees, right? There's your fee for fire protection, your fee for trash protection, your fee for that. Many places, though, still have a unified single tax bill. Maybe they'll split school tax and property tax, but many places just you pay one tax bill and it's all bundled up there and you can't sort of differentiate uh, how it's how it's going uh, and where it's going. Do I know how many dollars? No. Do I know that there are constant reports and litigation about this? That much I do know. Um, how much would it cost these people a year? Hundreds probably I would imagine is all we're talking about, but that's how class action lawyers make their living, um, by bundling those, those people together. What about rental restrictions? Um, for instance, uh, in our condominium, we uh, started getting so many rentals that uh, we're pushing up against the Fannie Mae or FHA restrictions on, they won't even give loans past a certain amount of rentals. So we instituted, um, kind of a fee for rentals. And I'm wondering uh, if that's legal. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to pine on that. But wait a minute. The problem was that there were too many rentals so that, so that individuals could not get new mortgages because of that. Right. And the solution was? We came up with the solution that you know rentals are fine up until that point. And then after that, all the rental all the rentals have to kick in extra money to to make up for the loss in value of all the other. Oh my. How's that going to get the next person a mortgage? Well, hopefully it's going to discourage people from <laughs> renting. <laughs> okay. Um, you should talk to one of the economists they're going to talk to you about incentives afterwards. All right. I want to stop it here. I'm happy. I want to stay here. And thanks so much for coming and for your comments. <laughs>